Welcome to the first edition of Alpha Cigar History Corner. And tonight we have esteemed guest Justin Hansen. Hello. Uh, University of Chicago historian, former Royal Danish Air Force, and also co founder of Alpha Cigar Company. Here we have TJ Kavanaugh, former Southern scholar, a absinthe cigar historian and co-founder of Alpha Cigar Company. Welcome, Tim. Oh, thank you. Uh, we're making these fireside chats uh, about cigar history uh, a regular thing, and tonight's theme is the history of absinthe-infused cigars. Uh, Tim, what are you smoking tonight? Tonight I am smoking the Alpha Absinthe-infused cigar. It is the world's first absinthe-infused cigar, as we say, but technically, it is only the world's first absinthe-infused cigar in modern history. Tim, I might say that this is a very, very nice cigar. Thank you, Justin. Um, so, what are you drinking tonight? Well, this is kind of a birthday tradition for me, as today is my birthday. Happy birthday. Thank you, Tim. 1985 Wars Ford. So, this, uh... That's an old one. Yes, this, this Ford has been uh, waiting for us for 31 years. Is that older than you? It's a little bit older we than you. We don't want to tell, yeah. Maybe it is. Is it older than you? Absolutely. <laughs> That's what they, you wish. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, it's a very enjoyable uh, drink because, first of all, I find that uh, there is uh, quite a prominent uh, note of tobacco leaf in the port. So, Wars 1985 pairs well with any cigar. Now you know it. Thank you. I feel like a sommelier tonight. Cheers, Dan. Cheers. So, the reason we're here is to talk about the history of the absinthe infused cigar, which has actually a very rich and vibrant history. Uh, and this is something that Justin and I had kind of learned about over the years, smoking cigars, and, and Justin's uh, family was part of a absinthe distillery in Pontelier, France. And we started... Pontelier? Ponte well, I think your French is better than me. Pontelier. Actually, I can't even pronounce it myself. So, the, the history of absinthe actually goes back very far, um, but the absinthe infused cigar just goes back to the Napoleonic times. And Napoleon, um, as many know, enjoyed his absinthe very much. And he was very protective of his own absinthe blend, which was made at this absinthe distillery in where, France? Pontarlier. Pontarlier, France. So, Napoleon actually had special guards to guard him. And he also... This was his elite guard. His elite guards. Mm -hmm. And he loved his absence so much, and when he went out and they were, you know, trying to uh, basically dominate all of Europe and, and, you know, on all of his endeavors, he made sure to leave part of his elite guards to guard the absent distillery. Well, yeah, so I, I, I don't know what the numbers exactly were. I mean, you're the expert here, Tim. Um, on this area of history, but I would say there was about three thousand. Well, really, because I've heard maybe four thousand, up to four thousand, because three to four thousand guards that were left there. I, I think you're right about the three thousand figure there, because it was the elite guard that guarded the absinthe distillery. Three thousand of them, but one thousand conscripted peasants, basically, that they just they took from the local right. populace yes. to guard. Yes. Because you know they recruited from the local populace as well. It was that important of so, a strategic. Point, Even this distillery, if, so. uh, when Napoleon was away in warring and, you know, France was to encounter some difficulties and cities would fall, uh, at least the distillery would be safeguarded. And the reason that Napoleon, uh, obviously he loved the taste of absinthe, he loved drinking it, but it became a very a good luck charm for him. So before every battle, he would make sure to have a glass of absinthe. Mm -hmm. And it started that way. And... Also, the only other people that were allowed to drink this absinthe were actually the very guards that guarded the absinthe distillery. Precisely. Yes. And so, so back then, um, basically, they would, they would actually mix it in with water because of sanitation and everything, and the idea was... Well, you know, kind Tim, of... can I interject here? Yes. Well, okay, so during the Napoleonic terms, uh, times, and uh, I'm somewhat of an expert in this field because I was a history undergraduate at University of Chicago, uh, you know, these times, basically the mortality rate for any battalion, any given battalion in, in, in any side, whether it be French or British, 
mm -hmm. uh, it would actually be at least 20% non-combat causes. So they I mean, fall sick. They fall long. sick. I mean, this was a time of they didn't have sanitation standards. But this one regiment, this the one regiment that guarded the distillery that made the Alpha Cigar Company cigars. Mm -hmm. What do you? What would you guess is the mortality rate? I mean, Tim, you know, but yeah, it was it was very high. It was very high. I, I mean, mean, it would have been well over. for non for the non absinthe. Most of them did not last the age of thirty. Uh, the, oh, the, that's the general yeah. populace, right? And also the non, you know, the non-Napoleonic battalions. But right. the mortality rate for the guys that guarded the distillery was double that. Lower, much lower. The mortality. Yeah. The rate. Mor mortality rate is much lower, but they would live to double the age. They would uh, live the, to the yeah. general uh, combat troop that that didn't die of you know causes uh, fighting in the fields. So actually, the, the mortality so, rate of the sorry Tim. But the mortality rate of these uh, battalions that were served absinthe, as opposed to just water, mm -hmm. was actually about 5%, whereas generally a Napoleonic battalion would have a 20% mortality rate from so, yes. non combat injuries. Yeah. And Sorry, so this, this, this absinthe now is called La Maison Fontaine, of the fountain. And they called it basically the fountain of youth. Exactly. And that it could ward off sickness and all of that, and, and these guys could live, you know. Forever. Well, not forever, but at least twice the age of the average civilian at that time, or average combat troop. But so this became a very sought after absent right. throughout the world, and word spread. Mm -hmm. And it spread throughout Europe and even as far as the Orient. Mm -hmm. And it was it was very sought after. But Napoleon he was very guarded over over this absent, because it was his favorite absent and it brought him luck during battle. So people would come from far and wide to try to barter and trade to get some of this absinthe. And they would come and they would bring fine silks, they would bring jewels, they would bring women. And Napoleon wouldn't budge. But the one thing, his one weakness, was cigars. And that whoa, was whoa. This... Tim, let me interject. So, um, cigars. This is uh, Napoleonic era. Um, where would he have gotten these cigars from? I mean, you can't exactly grow cigars in right. Europe. So the, the Spanish... Uh, had control of the Caribbean, and they basically had control of all the tobacco trade and the fine cigars in the world at that time. Okay. So the only thing that Napoleon would barter for his premium absinthe were premium cigars. Mm -hmm. So then, as a cigar smoker, he brought the cigars into his whole ritual before every battle. So then he would have some Wait, absinthe. What do you mean? So, so before Napoleon would go into battle, uh, you know, he, he, he'd go in with his troops, his generals and everything, script the battle, and before they would break meeting to go out and, and, and start um, their escapades, he would have a cigar and absinthe. And he would take the cigar and he would dip it into the absinthe before he would smoke it, and then he would smoke the cigar. Oh, well, that became his good luck charm. Okay, I, I, you know what, I actually didn't really know about the personal history between the absinthe and cigar and Napoleon before this, but um, from what I, I've heard of uh, Napoleon's elite guards is that basically, yeah, they were served absinthe in order to give them uh, right. some, a boost of energy before the battle, one, and two, to actually sanitize their water. Yes. But I actually, very that's very fascinating, Tim, that you bring it up about the uh, personal history about Napoleon, yes. because... I didn't know that, that he actually did the uh, absinthe infused himself. Yes, so that is the original, so we are the first modern time absinthe infused cigar. But Napoleon himself was the first to actually do the first infused cigar. So we have to give credit where credit is due. <clears throat> and uh, so, actually, Tim, you're a, you're, you're a professional in this area, absinthe infused cigar history. I mean, you have multiple PhDs. <laughs> So, yes, could you, depending on the definition of PhD, <laughs> you know. Sorry guys, yeah, yeah, we're being a bit immature here, you know, some of you might know what we're talking about, but PhD might be... So, let's get back to the... Go look it up on an Urban Dictionary if you don't know what a PhD is. Anyhow, so yeah, sorry. So, Tim... Uh, Justin doesn't know, he only had to look it up to find out. So. <laughs> yeah, Tim yeah, just told me, it, yeah, you know, you know, I'm pretty easy to... I'm, it's easy to make me laugh, but, but Tim, what I wanted to get to was the... the, the, the the crucible, the the ultimate uh, let's symbol. Just say, no, no, no. Let's just say the climax of the Napoleonic Wars, Battle of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. 
Why is it that Napoleon lost, in your opinion? Okay, well before that, are we going to touch on the symbolic nature of the cigar and the... Well, Tim, we this today? is your interview. I mean, right. I'm just... I'm so just before historian. we get there, I um, just want to go back and talk about the, the, the Cerberus, the Greek mythological creature. Of course, of course. We can't... The story isn't complete without that, just having that. And the absence of the cigar, Cerberus, and this was actually the emblem that was etched onto Napoleon's guards. And that's how people knew when they saw the service that these were his guards and, and you know, they were, you know, some of the most elite and revered uh, warriors of the Napoleonic times. Actually, uh, yeah, Tim, can I interject here? So the, um, if you don't mind me interjecting, the, um, actually this server symbol is a very fascinating symbol for mm -hmm. infantry units in France. Uh, during the Napole Napoleonic times, and actually, Absolutely. it was only until recently, actually, uh, ver very much so, just a few months ago, that uh, this Cerberus symbol was discovered in um, mass graves uh, for Napoleonic soldiers in Cannes, in France. You know, Cannes, where the, the film festival is now. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, some of us. I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm I'm not very French. versant in French, or but. Uh, mm -hmm. In that area, yeah, in Cannes. So why the Cerberus? Why did they? Why was special about the Cerberus that? I told you this before. Well, the uh, well, well do you want me to say it or? Yeah, go ahead and introduce it. Well, I mean, uh, you are the historian. Okay. Well, according to ancient sources, uh, based on you know um, scrolls that have been found in ancient absent distilleries, it's basically that the Holy Trinity. <laughs> the Holy Trinity of Absinthe. Yeah, you know. Is, no, 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 no. There's three mm -hmm. heads. Okay, Cerberus, ancient Greek mythological symbol, isn't it? Three heads on the dogs of the Cerberus, and the three heads actually res represent wormwood, fennel, and anise. Um, and so... Which is known as the Holy Trinity of Absinthe. Yeah, exactly. And coincidentally, these are actually the three main flavor profiles of the Alpha Cigar that Napoleon himself enjoyed. He may call it Alpha Cigar, but he didn't know absinthe infused cigar. That that is the modern day reincarnation of the mm -hmm. of the uh, cigar that Napoleon enjoyed, which you guys are gonna enjoy or are enjoying right now, hopefully. Uh, actually, Tim, can you tell us, uh, maybe give us a little bit of information about where we can actually enjoy these uh, historical cigars? These historical cigars um, should be your local tobacconist should have them. Uh, and if they do not, ask them about it, and you can actually contact us at info at alphacigar.com and we'll make sure that, that they have them available to you at, uh, their, you know, as soon as we can, we'll get them out. And uh, I might want to add, Tim, if I could interject, uh, that uh, you could actually buy them at uh, Cigars and More in San Carlos, or perhaps if you're so inclined to be in Chicago, Gianni Cigars in Bridgeport, which is right next to the White Sox side. Pride of the South Side. Pride of the South Side. Uh, you know, we we, uh, we like to place our retailers near the Sox game, uh, not Sox Stadium. Right, so let's not get it, this, this is not about us, it's about the history. Yeah, the that's true, that's true. Here. So let's, let's, let's get back to the history, you're right, you're right. Um, okay, so where were we? We, we, oh, we, 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 yeah. we, we got to the Battle of Waterloo, basically. Right, yes. So the Battle of Waterloo, and what was Napoleon? And this is him. He would say later in his in in, in his you know as he got older and, and, and after the fall of the Napoleonic Empire, um, little known but interesting fact, he would blame it on not being able to uh, have his regular ritual, and his his ritual was actually. Uh, interfered with because there was a shipment of absinthe that was coming towards Napoleon and it was ambushed actually by the enemy before that. The British. The British. And so the British, well knowing, they knew, you know, his ritual and everything like that. It was well known at the time. Maybe it had his absinthe and cigar. So mm -hmm. they stole the absinthe. Mm -hmm. And they actually drank it themselves. And they, they, uh, in a, it, almost a mocking way, but almost at the same time, you know, taking in the absinthe and the experience and everything. 
And then, of course, the battle went on, and Napoleon, um, you know, was markedly distraught that he didn't have his Athens. Although he tried not to let it bother him, they went on, his generals and made their plans for battle, all that. Uh, but Napoleon lost. Napoleon lost and he was defeated, and that was the beginning of the fall of the Napoleonic Empire. So, let's, let's fast forward here. And actually, Tim, I don't want to brag, but perhaps maybe this is where my historical research has sort of taken over. Right. After right. the defeat of Napoleon. Right. So, basically, uh, as we all know, Napoleon was imprisoned on a very, very small island called St. Helens, which has mm -hmm. uh, a very significant yes. shortage of absinthe. But they also uh, had built him living quarters in New Orleans called Napoleon That's House. True. That's and true. any Americans that have been to New Orleans, maybe gone to Napoleon House, and you know in New Orleans um, there are absinthe houses. Mm -hmm. That's true. And that didn't really work out. So they ended up imprisoning him on St. Helens, which is a little bit far from absinthe country. It's a little bit far from Pontarlier. And uh, mm -hmm. Napoleon was furious about this. I mean, firstly, because it was far from his homeland in France, but secondly, because it was far from his distillery, La Fontaine, yes. far from his cigars in the Dominican Republic. So, as a, as a sort of compromise, what they did serve was Ozo, which is basically the Greek version of absinthe. And, you know, that, that actually led to a very quick deterioration. He complained about it, but he needed something. They, need, they needed something to give him, because day after day he would complain, where's my absinthe, where's my absinthe, where's my, absinthe? Where's my Maison Fontaine? Where's my La Maison Fontaine? And that didn't really work out well, and as we all know, that's where the story ends. And he, he deteriorated quite quickly. Uh, instead of great Dominican cigars, all they could offer him was some pretty subpar Cuban cigars. A uh, terrible tragedy, really. I mean, right. and they couldn't offer him absinthe. It was, you know, some sort of uh, different kind of licorice tasting, you know, liquor Ozo, that Ozo, they they concocted. And but they so, they tried to make it taste like absinthe, and and they actually ended up accidentally putting too much. There was arsenic in it. Right. You can and, look this this up. I mean, his he and actually in recent years, forensic they, analysis. Forensic has analysis shown. Has shown that they tested uh, one of his hairs and that it was the arsenic that killed him was basically the fake absinthe that his servants were trying to feed him um, because they were trying to get him out, trying to you know trick him into thinking all this is absinthe, trying to calm him and everything, but they were actually just ended up poisoning him on accident. But Tim, if I may say so, I mean you know this very well as you are a historian yourself, but it it it, it, it often is very hard to make bold historical statements, but I'm just gonna go out here and say it. What killed Napoleon was the combination of Cuban cigars infused with ozo from Greece. And that's just, you know, that basically was the final straw on the canvas back. I mean, right. I mean, what, what, what would have been a better alternative? I'm sure you could suggest one. Well, a, an actual You're smoking Dominican right now. absinthe infused cigar. Exactly. And if he hadn't been drinking St. Helens wine and drinking some nice wars, 1985 port, maybe things would have been different. But We'll never know. He will forever be known as a great general. Tim will Absolutely. forever be... TJ will be forever known as a great absinthe cigar historian. And, uh, well, on this blog, you will be forever we'll memorialized. Thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, welcome to California. It's good to be here. Thank you all for joining us on our fireside uh, cigar history chat. And hope to see you again. Stay smoky, my friends. Don't forget to ask your local tobacconist about Alpha Absinthe and Pew Cigar, one of uh, the cigar world's most historical cigars. Cheers.